Hello, we're here today to talk to Dr. James Anderson, uh, who's a lecturer and researcher at the University of Reading. Hello, James. Hi there. Um, can you tell us what you're currently working on at the University of Reading? Well, I'm, I do all my normal teaching in computing. So I teach stuff like uh, compilers and the mathematics behind computer science. Uh, teach a little architecture, so hardware and software. And I do research in um, a new supercomputer architecture called the Perspex machine and the mathematics behind that. So you mentioned the supercomputer. Can you tell us a bit more about the Perspex machine? Sure. The Perspex machine started off as a mathematical idea to right. turn everything that's Turing computable, and that means everything that's computable, into geometry so that it can be done by a machine shining laser light through a pinhole. You get very, very fast computation completely impractical to build it. <laughs> right. So then I uh, changed it so that it work, would work in two dimensions, which means you can paint the computation on the surface of a chip. So the whole of the chip is operating on processing. And that makes a vast difference. Only about 3% of the circuitry in a standard computer is engaged in processing. The rest of it is maintaining the von Neumann model of computation. Basically, the computers we use today lie about the physics of the universe. They say you can get data from any distance in constant time, and you can't, because you've got the light speed constraint, a uh, recent scale in neutrinos notwithstanding. So you've got the light speed constraint, you have to wait until data is ready. And standard computers wait for about 90% of their time. So when you're buying a computer, 90% of it is doing nothing in time. And about 95, 97% of it is doing no processing in terms of die area in the machine. So there's a vast amount of work goes into maintaining the lie that you can get data in constant time. If you get rid of that lie and do a data flow machine instead, where the data flows through the processor, then it flows through at a time proportional to the distance and you're not lying about the universe. In that case, almost all of the machine does useful computation. And that's how I built the supercomputer. Ah. You know, you said you're, you're raising money, funds, to create this computer. That's right. How's that going and who are you targeting it, for? It's funding? going very well. I'm talking to people in the City of London. Uh, I hope we're close to closing a deal on that and we'll actually build the machine. It's very expensive to build a new supercomputer. And is beyond the range of what you can do. Um, with grants from the research councils. So um, I hope it's going to make quite a significant contribution to uh, computing. Firstly, on its throughput, it's got very, very fast processing speeds um, because it obeys the physics of the universe. And secondly, it uh, is very secure and safe computation, and that depends on the mathematics. It sounds like a a much more efficient way of doing computational. It, it's hugely efficient in terms of a floating point operation. It uses about 1% of the electricity to do that operation, which is a tremendous gain. So it's greener IT. It's a greener IT. <laughs> Maybe using a supercomputer wouldn't be a brilliant idea in the home. <laughs> uh, no. But it, f if you need that level of computation, then it's much more efficient. So ultimately, uh, if a supercomputer would be built, um, mm. say in three years' time or whatever, what, what um, direction would you want to be using it? Uh, what, what, what sort of projects would you be using it on? Initially, things like weather forecasting, real-time trading in the city, uh, designing cars, trains, planes, fluid dynamics, uh, medical image processing, all sorts of stuff like that. Now, um, having done a little bit of research on you, I've noticed <laughs> that you seem to be a little bit of a maverick in that you've, uh, you've claimed to, for example, solve a problem of dividing by zero. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, it, it is very controversial. I have to say <laughs> that right at the beginning. And I should also say that it is absolutely impossible to divide by zero using the real number system, which is what all of our science is based on. But there are several ways that you can work around those limitations and divide by zero, and different people have done it in different ways. 
what I did was add three new numbers. So plus infinity is any positive number divided by zero, negative infinity is any negative number divided by zero, and I added the missing number. I call it nullity, zero divided by zero. When you add those three numbers, the ordinary rules of arithmetic continue to work. So mine is the first arithmetic in which the ordinary rules of arithmetic continue to apply. I should just add as a little tweak that it's only partially distributive. Okay. You've uh, you also reported saying about the I triple E floating yeah. point arithmetic and saying that you felt that that and the NAN, not a number mm. uh, um, idea ideology, was invalid. I mean, what did you mean by that? Well, first of all, I triple E works. It does what it says on the tin. It has some very weird properties that NAN is not equal to itself. So the idea of equality is broken inside the machine if you're doing floating point computations. And that's very, very serious. You need to be aware that a number might not be, well, that an object might not be equal to itself. Uh, it breaks all of our preconceptions about how the, the universe works, and you can't do physics with NAN. If instead you use my numbers, you can do physics with it. You can have infinite forces, you can have nullity forces, you can calculate what happens when two uh, infinite forces interact. All of those things um, generalise to the whole of our engineering um, physics, so they're useful numbers. And they're practical as well, so IEEE wastes an awful lot of states for the NAND numbers. It wastes so many states that you could double the range of real numbers if you got rid of it. So I do get rid of it and I store uh, nullity at the place where minus zero is encoded. I don't need minus zero. And I shift plus and minus infinity so that they're the biggest bit patterns in the machine. And that doubles the range of real numbers. Not a huge effect in floating point, but significant. And in practice, it means that if your algorithms can maintain significance in the bits during the computation, then you obtain twice the accuracy. And that's a contingent statement that says, if you can maintain significance, then the result is twice as accurate. And that's useful because getting twice the accuracy out of lots of practical algorithms would be a good thing. Uh, and why waste that opportunity? So that there's a very, very serious issue there that this would be a more efficient way of designing any floating point unit. And it would be simpler too. There's an awful lot of circuitry in the IEEE 754 circuits that handles NAN and encodes information in it. You don't need any of that circuitry if you use my arithmetic. So the floating point chips get smaller. And remember what I said about the light speed constraint, smaller means faster. And now, not only faster, but more accurate and cheaper to produce. And quite a lot cheaper. The cost of producing a chip is exponential in its die area. So reducing the size brings huge savings. And going back to my earlier point, a greener um, type of computer. Slightly <laughs> greener. <laughs> the computation. What, what matters in a von Neumann machine, it's like you've got a magic finger that's running around the circuitry using up electricity as it goes. So what matters is the path through the circuitry that consumes the energy. It's not the size of the thing itself. So making things smaller makes it fast, but not necessarily more efficient. You'd have thought then that your peer group um, and the, the industry would be very interested in um, wanting to test your hypothesis. <laughs> um, wh why is there a reluctance to kind of... Uh, <clears throat> believe you, for example, and maybe do some research going down that, that route? The, the reluctance comes from the bad publicity I got um, when I, the nullity stuff was um, published. I put out um, a preprint of a conference paper and about 100,000 people flamed me on that. Uh, I got death threats and people really? tried to get me fired and stuff like that. Um, it's not too bad being flamed on. It hurts at the time, but you learn to deal with it. And certainly being flamed on the web is better than being burnt at the stake. True, because you can do something <laughs> about it afterwards. So that puts um, 
people off. The technical people in the computing community, IBM, Intel, those guys, the guys who really know their stuff, completely get my story um, and are waiting for me to do it. The issue for them is that this breaks the von Neumann model of computation. You're going to have to rewrite all of your programs in order to take advantage of my hardware. You can still run your existing programs, but to take advantage of it, you have to move away from uh, the von Neumann model, the lie about the physics of the universe. And the reason is that that lie is so deeply embedded that languages have evolved to exploit the lie. And if you're playing data flow, you don't want to use ex those exploitations because they rely on the lie. Getting rid of them produces a data flow machine. So you can program my machine in a subset of con contemporary languages. Now, an advantage to bringing this architecture in, remember it uses 1% of the electricity, it's much smaller, it's cheaper to buy, maybe 5% of the cost of an equivalent uh, machine. And that creates a much bigger market for supercomputers. It'll have tremendous implications for anyone who wants to design any technical product and sell it, or who wants to do um, credit ratings on transactions in the web. All, all that stuff will go faster and the market will be big. Now, those new people don't have legacy code. They've got to write their applications from new. So there's no hurdle to them entering the market. The supercomputing market is already used to rewriting every three years when they replace their hardware. And the reason is that people have moved away from the von Neumann model to using GPGPUs uh, inside the machine to get extra processing power. And those require rewriting the software. So the supercomputing market has now moved to the position where it will accept a rewrite. And there's a whole bunch of research uh, about to go on in Europe on programming styles um, and research to make it possible to transfer parallel processing programs from one architecture to another. That's a really, really hard problem. Uh, and I was able to circumvent that by exploiting my mathematics. So it does seem like if you, people are going to have to spend a fair bit of money to create this cheaper to run, mm. you know, faster computer, mm. but it sounds like we are at a little bit of a threshold at the moment, and you're saying that it will work initially with the supercomputers, but what will happen on the more general layman's terms with uh, your, your sort of desktop computers? Is there any applications for, for sure. that? Sure, uh, initially I'm going for the supercomputing market because the margins are higher and it's easier to get a return on the investor's money. Mm. Uh, later on, you can use the chips in um, domestic applications. So a single chip would have more processing power than you can currently imagine. And you could use it, for example, for encryption on hard drives. It could take data off the hard drive, encrypt or decrypt it in real time uh, at data transfer speeds. Same, you could do um, decoding of television pictures. Uh, applications where you might use specialist chips at the moment, you can replace them with a general one and bring the price down. It will be a very long time before it's suitable for mobile applications because they're very, very power sensitive. Uh, but in the longer term, you can imagine maybe uh, having enough processing power in your smartphone to have voice recognition work in the smartphone. At the moment it doesn't. You speak to your smartphone and it sends a signal off to a server farm, it gets processed and the answer comes back. You can just about imagine in you know, 10, 20 years time having that much processing power in the smartphone itself. Now, you're also known for uh, your transreal arithmetic. Mm. Can you explain a little bit um, how that works, particularly in relation to the com computational um, research you're doing? Yeah, the, the transreal arithmetic, as I said, I invented three numbers, plus infinity, minus infinity, nullity, and use the existing rules of arithmetic. And because computers already implement addition, subtraction, division, all sorts of operations, those circuits continue to work. And sometimes the circuits I use are smaller because I don't have to stop division by zero. 
What the arithmetic does is it has no exceptions, so you can perform any operation. Any operation you give it will succeed. So if I want to divide any numbers by any other, it will succeed. There will be no logical fault. Now that's very, very powerful. It turns out that you can turn any computer program into arithmetic by a process called girdleization. If the arithmetic has no exceptional states, then running any program has no exceptional states. If you build the architecture correctly, and that's what I spent some years doing, yeah. uh, then you get the behavior that if a program compiles, it will not have any logical runtime errors. It will not crash for a logical reason. It can crash for a physical reason. You hit it with an axe, a gamma ray splats some memory, whatever, but there will be no software faults. Imagine what that does for conventional computing. Your machine will never blue screen. <laughs> Except for a hardware reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that sounds like a very good uh, pragmatic reason to continue that uh, mm. down that route. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about a book. Mm. You've got this nice book, uh, The Court of Pythagoras, mm. um, in front of us. Um, can you explain what your relation to this book is? Yeah, this is The Cult of Pythagoras. There are lots of books with the title The Cult of Pythagoras. This one is subtitled Math and Myths. Uh, it's written by Alberto Martinez. I have no relationship with him um, prior to him writing the book. He's a professional historian and has written about the history of mathematics, including um, the controversy around division by zero, which has been going on for about a thousand years. Right. So people have wanted to divide by zero for about a thousand years. It turns out that if you add in those three numbers, plus infinity, minus infinity, and nullity, then you can. The operations you already knew for the last thousand years continue to work. I need to be very clear, actually, that it's the algorithms that work. Um, mathematicians tend to define operations up as inputs and outputs. That specification fails on division by zero. But if instead you move symbols around the way people do when they're working on pencil and paper, then those algorithms, those physical operations, correctly divide by zero. And that's what makes it possible to make a computer divide by zero using the circuitry we've already got. Um, so. Martinez um, writes about the history in just one chapter, chapter six, the history of division by zero. Uh, and he concludes that my proposal is certainly controversial uh, and appears to be correct. About 50,000 people have downloaded the proof and no one's found a fault in it. So there's, I don't think anyone realistically, any informed person believes there's a fault with the division by zero, using those three numbers, including nullity. Um, and Martinez makes the point that you know, controversies happen in mathematics. Mathematics is a, an artifact, it's a creation. People should be allowed to create things even if other folks get upset about it. Um, and that's what I do. Um, I've done this mathematics and I aim to show that it is um, useful and important in standard computers because it's safer and in supercomputers because it increases throughput. So do you think there will be um, a bit of shift in opinion within your peer group that they'll come around to your way of thinking at some point? Or there, is, some of them <laughs> there is already a shift. Uh, the, it started off, um, James is a loony, he's mad, he's wrong. <laughs> uh, the, the shift now is, well, James is correct. You can divide by zero using those three numbers. Uh, and some people like that idea, very, very few. Um, actually, there's more take up in Brazil than there is in Britain. There are more scientists researching transverse arithmetic in Brazil than there are in Britain. Um, so Britain is losing the race on exploiting that technology. That aside, <laughs> uh, my peers recognize that it's correct and they're waiting to see if I can prove it useful. And I'm pushing ahead on several fronts. There's the computing front and there's the physics front. So, hello Stephen Hawking, <laughs> <laughs> I can divide by zero and solve physical problems at a singularity. Happy to talk to you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>